celebration event Shinobi Kai, uh, and then uh, in combination with uh, baptisms on tomorrow. Um, we know that uh, uh, all members are uh, required to be present for the baptisms, uh, and that it's, a, uh, it's for the house of God to come together, those who are born-again, blood-washed believers and members of FCW, to come together and support and pray uh, and intercede and worship uh, as uh, new believers and older believers alike are uh, baptized by immersion on tomorrow. Uh, that event will begin, uh, that portion of the event, the picnic and baptisms, will begin at, um, I ask you to start showing up around 11 um, the actual baptisms and so forth probably uh, won't take place till uh, little after that. Um, I myself and a few others won't be there um, till probably around noon, uh, maybe 12:30 at the latest. Um, but if you guys can get up, set, you know, get there around 11, start setting up a place and getting everything lined out, that we can do that. We're going to have a sign-up sheet uh, present in the uh, fellowship hall uh, at today after service. Uh, so for everyone who's attending, which is pretty much everyone, um, you'll have uh, a chance to contribute uh, by bringing items uh, that uh, need to be brought. Um, so uh, see Sister Chrissy for that she, uh, and uh, Sister Sable. They're the ones who will be handling the uh, sign-up sheet if they have not done so already. So again, once again, uh, oh, location's good. You probably need to know that. Um, we uh, will be meeting at uh, Camp Ben. If you don't know where it's at, see... Uh, Minister Clark or uh, one of the other uh, members and they can help you out and let you know where it's at, okay? So, all right, uh, if there's no questions on that, uh, again, once again, uh, it'll be 11 o'clock on tomorrow, Camp Ben, okay? And then uh, I'll be out there about 12, a little after 12, and then we'll have our picnic and our baptisms and all that, okay? Very good. Tomorrow's going to be another uh, exciting day, a very exciting day. I'm very uh, excited about it. I'm looking forward to it. Um, there's something, you know, uh, I don't I'm going to have a sermon today and a sermon tomorrow about baptism, but, you know, baptism is much like a, a, new, a new believer um, confessing his faith in Christ and repenting of sin and, and asking forgiveness of God and, and uh, pledging himself unto the king, you know. Um, it, it's much like that uh, in the sense that um, the scripture says that you're buried, your, your flesh, your, your, your body, your spiritual old man uh, is buried underneath that water and you rise up. Uh, spiritually a new man in the sight and uh, eyes of Christ. And that's why um, he says, repent each and every one of you and be baptized in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. That's not a, uh, it's not a um, suggestion, right? And there's only one way to be baptized, right? And there's only w one way in the, in, uh, to be baptized, and we've discussed that before in new member orientation, so you know that already. Uh, but aside from that, um, and there's only one time, and there's not, contrary to belief, there's not just one time in your life to be baptized. Um, so we know there's two different baptisms, the baptism by immersion, the, bap the, the baptism of water, and then there's the baptism of spirit. Um, so there, again, there's, there's two separate baptisms, but along with the, uh, with, a, well, with the baptism of water, um, you know, you can be baptized, and it has to be a, a decision you have to make to want to be baptized. You can't Nobody can force it upon you, and uh, if you go through the motions just to do it because you're supposed to, um, it will have no effect. God sees your heart, right? And see, that's the thing. You can't fool God, <laughs> right? You can, fool men, you can fool some men some of the time, but you can't fool God any time, right? So he knows your heart, and he knows the desire, and for, for going down and into that water, when you're coming up, when you're going down into it, you're basically going down into death. And the death that, we, that we're speaking of, you know, we know that the, even in the scripture it says uh, things first must die before that they can live. A seed must fall to the ground and die that before it can sprout forth and bring new life. Um, so there has to be the death of the physical um, and the spiritual body, rather, the death of the old man, the death of your sin life that has to take place. So it's a pledge unto God saying, um, I'm willing to die for you. I'm willing to give up my past. I'm willing to give up my old ways. I'm willing to give up everything. And I'm willing uh, to be washed and made, made clean by your hand, by your sacrifice, by your blood, and by this uh, sacrificial observance of baptism by immersion. And then, proceed, and then following that, rather, um, can come baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is the second baptism, which is the empowering of the Holy Spirit 
um, to do uh, where you receive your giftings and you receive all those things that God has in store for you to bear fruit um, and preach the word and minister to others with boldness. That's something, again, that cannot be, f- you cannot be faked. You know, you can't fake that. Um, and so um, there's a lot of things you can fake, but you can't fake fruit. Amen? I mean, you can get some, you can get some strawberry-flavored uh, bubble gum, but it ain't the same as a strawberry, right? You know, you can get the, some orange Fanta <laughs> or, or, or Tang or... What was that stuff that you, what was the stuff they used to have in that bottle? Man, it, it was, huh? Fago. No, I don't, I don't even know what that one is. Fago. No, it was, it was like that. It was like a juice that they would sell, and it was in a, in a bottle, and people would drink. Uh, Sunny Delight, I think that was it. Oh. Sunny Delight. And you look on it, it had zero, zero juice, no juice at all. It was just orange chemicals. Really, it really was. Just, and even the water on it says water sufficient for processing. Not even, not even good water. <laughs> They give you some old dirty water with some chemicals in it, and it tastes like oranges, and kids drink it up. But you can't fake the real deal, right? There's nothing better than God's uh, produce. So amen. On today, I want to talk to you about something as we get into today's message. Today's message is cross-draw. Cross-draw. Um, now, I, want to, I know you didn't come here for, uh, for this uh, type of training on today, but I'm giving it to you anyways because I can um, cross draw. So when you're talking about firearms and you're talking about a cro- uh, talking about cross draw, um, basically most times you have what's called uh, you, if you're right-handed, your left-hand side is called your support side. Your right-hand side is called your strong side, right? So if you're holstering a weapon, uh, typically you holster on your strong side. So if you have if you're uh, law enforcement or military or if um, paramilitary or uh, tactical or whatever you whatever you are um, or just concealed carry, um, typically if you're right-handed you're going to conceal on your on your right side on your strong side. That's your the side you would draw out from. And there's many tactical advantages to to drawing out from that particular side. You get on point much faster, much easier, much quicker. Uh, when you draw out, you go directly uh, to the target, and you have a greater target acquisition and greater uh, speed uh, of target acquisition. Uh, cross drawing is a little different. Cross drawing instead of me drawing from this side c- coming from here, you're drawing where you're holstering your weapon on this side, as demonstrated with my yellow pistol. Okay. I had to do that for the camera because uh, I could just see if I, I was thinking about using my airsoft, but I could just see some people start blogging online. Oh, he drew a gun on the congregation, and <laughs> you know, and, and, no, it's yellow, it's rubber. Look, it bends. Okay, <laughs> so I didn't paint a pistol yellow. It's actually rubber, rubber. Okay, last time. All right, so when you cross draw, you come you come across here. The problem with it is, and again, when you draw it out across the body, it swings around this direction, right? So you have some tactical disadvantages. It takes longer to draw it out that way. Um, so, not, but there are some advantages. One of the advantages is, is that when you're seated in a vehicle, it's easier to obtain your pistol. It's easier to obtain your, your weapon. If you're seated down, then the, typically the, the barrel would sit, seek down into the seat, and you can't really pull it up all that easily on that side, and your hand gets kind of cramped up. But if, you, if you're in the car and you keep it on this side, you can draw it out much easier. That's really one of the only advantages to it. So, why am I telling you to this today? Just, uh, th- what bearing does this have on anything? Well, when you understand about drawing your weapon, and you understand about where to place the weapon for the most advantageous position, depending upon the situation that you're in. And it's not one gun fits all, right? It's not one sword fits all, one staff fits all. So, you have to understand not only what weapon fits you, but also what tool you need for the job, right? So a Phillips screwdriver ain't going to work the same as a flathead, and, and you know, so you, you, you need to know what tool it is. So the, with pistols, you're talking about calibers predominantly and barrel length and uh, cartridge capacity or magazine capacity. So you're talking about these various things, and whether you need night sights, you need optics, whether you need uh, some type of a laser, or you need a lighting system, or you need a scope, or you need whatever the case is. There's different things. You have to outfit things properly. But more importantly than all those things, you need to know how to use your weapon efficiently and proficiently, right? 
So you have to be accurate and proficient. Just because you can draw it fast doesn't mean you can hit anything. Just because you can hit something doesn't mean you can draw fast. So you have to get, be able to draw it out and get directly on target to be um, most equipped to defend yourself or others. We watched that video the other night. By, by the way, I had this uh, prepare. I, I had this idea. God had given me this idea for cross draw last week. But then we watched the video last night of that guy that um, was on the quick draw, uh, which was amazing, by the way. So it just kind of further confirmed what I was going to be uh, speaking on today. But when you're talking about drawing and knowing what weapon you need to use, knowing how to use your weapon, I, you know, I teach people all the time, all the time, who say, oh, no, 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 listen, I've, I've taught Marines, I've taught, I mean, every facet of every type of walk in life, anybody from, you know, feds to Marines to uh, SEALs to uh, college students to you name it, businessmen to whatever, it doesn't really matter, kids. And most everyone who, especially men who have a gun, uh, will say, oh, yeah, 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 I know what I'm doing. I know how, yeah, I've been dealing with guns my whole life. Or, yeah, I shoot all the time. And, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? What, whatever. I don't believe them. I never believe them. Put the gun in your hand. As soon as I see it get in your hand, I know where your experience level is. You know, I've had guys go out to the range and shoot that, um, the, the Marines, mind you, that put the, bullet, put the uh, cartridges in the magazine backwards because they're so nervous on the range. It blows your mind. So knowing your weapon and knowing how to use your weapon and, know, and, and being comfortable with your weapon is, is paramount. It's important, especially when you have an enemy firing back at you. See, on the shooting range, you can stand there and you can take your time. You can get on target. You, you, know, you can uh, learn how to uh, do sight alignment, sight picture. You can learn all the different components, trigger pull. You can learn breathing patterns, stances. You can get all that stuff and you have time to do it. When somebody's firing back at you, it's a whole other thing. You just don't stand there in the open and let them fire at you without taking cover and without understanding uh, tactical defense and movement and, and, and posturing and all the different uh, things that you need to know to defend yourself or someone else. How does this work? How does this apply biblically? Well, because you need to know the Word of God. But not just knowing the Word of God is not good enough. We've said that before. You know that it, just because you can quote Scripture doesn't mean anything. It means nothing. It doesn't matter if you can quote the whole Bible. The only thing that means something is who you know. Do you know Him and does He know you? And the Word of God is empowered by the Word of God. In other words, saying that, the Word of God is empowered by the one who spoke the Word, and the one who spoke the Word is Christ. If you don't know Christ and you're not in relationship with Him, not just because you profess to know Him, but because you're bearing fruit and we see you're a good tree, because He's known by you, and see, that's something that the world, again, won't understand is that as Christians, we are given discernment that supersedes natural discernment. We're given God's discernment, and there's a gift of discernment that is even greater than the discernment given to most Christians. But this natural discernment that's given unto us is that we're able to see God in other people. We're able to sense if this person's a faker or they're real. If they're faking, the, if they're faking fruit or it's the real fruit. If they're a good tree or if they're a bad tree. You can tell. And the higher your level of discernment is, and the more you're able to tell. The more you're able to see what's going on on the inside and what's happening and discern the truth from the lie. The light from the dark. Because just because, you know, there's people out there that profess to be good and they profess to be doing good things. I don't care if you're working at women's shelters, if you're feeding the poor, if you're doing all these wonderful, wonderful things that are, uh, that are good for society. You can be the best person in, in that respect, in those regards. But if you don't know Christ and you're not walking with him, it's all for nothing. And it's not going to be counted towards you for anything. It has no merit, no value in heaven. Scripture says, beware of the false light. There are people out there that appear to be good and appear to be uh, right and appear to be holy, but yet it's a false light. The Bible says even angels appear. Messengers, they appear to be messengers of God, but they're really messengers of Satan, and they have a false light. We know the eyes are the window to the soul, and inside you can see the light, or you can see the darkness. Or you see the shades of gray. It's so funny, too. It's not funny, but it's funny in a way. You know, some, it, it, it's good because sometimes it's, it, you can look into someone's eyes and you can see the, the, the light beginning to, to, to spark. 
It's like you see God's flint. You know, he's got the striker, and he's striking, and you see the sparks, the magnesium's going out, and, the, and you start to see the kindle start to get ablaze, and a, a little bit of stuff coming. And you know what? But when you, when you go away, read the parable of the seed and the sower, right? When they, when they go away, the word gets stolen, and they forget. And then they come back and it sparks and sparks until finally if they come enough and they get enough of God on the inside and they hear enough of the word, something changes, something happens, the bonds are loosed, you break free and then when you break free all of a sudden the fire is lit on the inside of you and you begin to recognize there is a God, He is alive, He is real, He does love you and He's willing to forgive you if you just lay down your life, if you just turn to Him, if you just put your arm around Him because He's already reaching out to put His arms around you. And you can see that light inside their eyes begin to grow and grow and grow as you get stronger and stronger in Christ. But those sometimes who are in Christ can fall away from Christ because of their life situations and life circumstances because they doubt and they place blame on God and because they look at the little picture, they look at the immediate moment and they feel like right now defines who I am and where I am and I don't really care, all I care about is now. But you have to look beyond the now, amen? You've got to look beyond your current circumstance and situation to see down the road. What does God have in store for me? How, what, it's not about me. It's about Him. And what can I do for you? Yeah, I'm going through a rough time today, but tomorrow I'm going to give you praise because you're worthy. Tomorrow I'm going to serve you. If you, want to, if you want to get better, it doesn't matter what, what, what's, what the situation is. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with cancer. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with death. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with loss. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with poverty. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with. If you want to get better, serve others in Christ's name. Amen? We've said that before. But how come I have to remind you? Because people forget. You come, you listen to the word... And you let it get in, but you don't practice the word. I don't care if you can repeat it back. I don't care if you, you know what I said. I don't care. If, unless you're living it, unless you're practicing what's being uh, preached, it's of no value and it, and it has nothing for you. So we're called to be a house of doers, amen? Not just a house of hearers who delude themselves. Understanding... The weapons of our warfare are paramount for our victory. Understanding who it is that obtained the victory for us and having a relationship with him changes everything in the, the whole dynamics of the battlefield. Remember the scripture says, I will give you hinds feet. Right? So he says that he'll give you hinds feet to climb upon the mountain, to go into the high places. The Bible says, who may ascend the hill of the Lord, lest he who has clean hands and a pure heart, right? Not a pure heart according to the world standard, but God's standard. When he looks into your heart, does he see the truth? Does he see the purity? They may ascend the hill of the Lord. They may go up and he'll give you hind feet that you won't slip and fall back down. But if you start, anybody, everybody knows when you're up high, you know, and I'm, I'm victim to this too. If you're up high, you know, now two or three stories doesn't bother me, right? But when you start getting eight stories or more for me, and I'm, if I was on the edge right here, eight stories, I feel like I'm getting sucked off. I need to go ahead and take a step back. Right? Everybody knows that if you're up high and you're walking like a high wire or rocking a rope bridge or whatever it is, you, everybody tells you, don't look down. And what does everybody do? Look down. Right? And then you get sick, you get nauseous, your equilibrium goes out, you, you, all that stuff starts to happen. You get vertigo, you know, in a, in a sense. And so you, all these things start to happen. You, you, you get disoriented and you get unbalanced. Everybody hear what I'm saying? When, when, when you get up higher, and you look down, you get disoriented, and you get unbalanced. Don't look down. Which, when you're looking down, a lot of times you're looking at your past. You're looking at the things that are already beneath you. You're looking at things that you've already conquered. You're looking at a, a road that's already behind you. You're looking at a, a hill that you've already uh, transversed. You're looking at something that you've already come up out of. And now you're trying to get to a higher place. So look up to where your help comes from. Amen? Don't look back down to the past. Don't look to all the things of the failures of the past. Don't look at what, it's what, what's below your feet. Just look at Christ. Keep your focus on him and keep climbing. Keep trekking. Keep breathing that air. Right? You know, when you get in higher altitude, that, that, uh, it gets harder and harder to breathe because the air gets thinner and thinner. So your body has a natural reaction. You produce more red blood cells. Now think about that. As you ascend the hill of the Lord, your blood gets thicker. Your blood gets stronger. Your blood gets able to contain more oxygen, more of the breath of God, spiritually speaking. The closer you get to God, the more of God you get on the inside of you and the more of an ability you have to contain him. Where was I going? 
Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. It says, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of deity, all the fullness of godliness, all the fullness of that which is God dwells in bodily form. In other words, he is God robed in the flesh. He is not man. He is not just a prophet. He is not just a, a, a wise teacher. He's not just a rabbi. He is not just a healer. He is not just a demon slayer. He is God walking in the flesh. The fullness of deity dwells in him. Amen? Amen. Now listen again. And in him, now we know we're establishing who he is. And now in him, you have been made complete. Everybody say complete. complete. You have been made complete. Do you believe it? Yes. You have been made complete. That means everything that God desires to do to you and to grow you in and for you to overcome everything of the past, every place he wants to heal you, everything that he wants to do for you to benefit you that you might continue to grow in Christ and become who he, did, he created you to be is on the inside of you. It's a seed that has been planted. The Bible says it's a spiritual seed that has been planted. That seed of Christ has been planted on the inside of you. And you are been made complete. That means if you keep pursuing him, you keep walking after him, you keep following him, you keep doing his will, you keep walking out your salvation with fear and trembling, that seed continues to get watered and it, and it grows and it grows and it grows. And as it grows, your completeness grows. And he, being Christ, now, this is what you need to understand here. He is the head over all rule and authority. Now, that, that's, you've got to capture that because that's going to be important for the rest of our, our message today. He is the head over all rule. That means there is no ruler that is higher. He has all the, he has all the power. He has all the authority. He has all the power and he has all the authority. The Bible says that demons shudder the mention of his name. I told you stories, when, you know, when, I, when uh, we were talking about, matter of fact, we were talking about some of this last night as well, when we were talking about uh, uh, chi cultivation and uh, energy transference and energy channeling and astral projection and all these different things when we were talking about that last night at our Shabbat meeting. It's so f interesting to me that, you know, I've met, you know, being in Japan, I've met master instructors who have been, you know, studying that for uh, 50, 60 years and have mastered it and are, prof uh, are very proficient at it and uh, can do supernatural feats with it just by the mere thought, just a mere thought. People writhe in pain, objects move, whatever the case, whatever they, their will is to, to, for it to occur, occurs. But it's so funny that when they try to do those things, whom would they have, when they have access to the, to the people of the, that they have access to unbelievers, see, if you're an unbeliever, then you're part of Satan's fold. You're part of Satan's flock. That's, if Christ says you're for me, you're against me, right? You're on my side or you're on his side. You can't be on me just on my side just in, 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 in word. You have to be on my side in action as well. Again, you have to die to yourself that you might live and be born again. For he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father lest he comes through me. Right? So we understand that. But it's so interesting over there. You see these master teachers, and they try to uh, cast a spell, or they try to use this chi, uh, the chi energy to, to, to affect something that, would, you know, they send somebody else flying across the room. All I say is blood of Christ. Blood of Yahshua. And they're perplexed. They're dumbfounded. Everything that they work their entire life for is completely thrown out the window just because I know the king. They can't do it. It has virtually zero effect. Nothing. You have to know your king, amen? If you know him, then you know how to access him. And when you access him, you can access the blood. And when you access the blood, you've got the power over all rule and over all authority. Nothing can come against you or harm you. Amen? The Bible finally says, he says to put on the full armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, it says, finally, finally, be strong in the king 
and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So finally, after you've done all the things, after you know him, after you love him, after you're walking with him, after you're following him, after you've learned of him and you're being discipled, you're being trained of him, be strong in him. Don't be weak in him. Don't let your situations weaken you. Don't make it let your hands fall limp just because you're going through something. Be strong in him. Now, that's easier said than done, but it gets easier as you know him more. You know, you know I think of it like this. Y'all have seen that painting? I don't know the name. I'm not a, even though I grew up around art my whole life, I'm not really know much of it. But I think it's Michelangelo, the painting where it supposedly has God reaching his hand out, and it's got the, was it Adam, I think? It's got his fingers, and their fingers are like almost touching kind of thing, right? As a new, as a, as a, as a new, um, uh, you know, the, the way I look at that in, in one context is simply this. That's a person seeking and searching for God, right? He's reaching for God. God's already reaching out to us. Now, had that been a follower, he would already know him and have met him, and they'd be holding hands. You see, the connection would already be made. It doesn't, there's, not, there's no separation if there's no sin. So what I'm saying is this. is The more that you get to know God, then you don't get just a handshake. You, don't, you, you go ahead and graduate to that forearm grip, right? And then you get past that, and then it becomes one arm around. The, you know how you get to know somebody a little better? Now it's an arm around the shoulder. You get a side hug, right? Then you get to know somebody a little better, and then you might go ahead and get a, a double hug, but not too close now, right? And then finally you get to know somebody a little better, then you put the full hug in, right? And then you love on them a little bit, Right? And then when you really love somebody and you really know them, you pick them up and you love them and you squeeze them and you, they, they, the connection, it's reciprocated. That's, when you, that's how you need to get with God. You need to get to that place where you and God just hug and love on each other because he wants to do that. The only thing that's stopping him from doing that is you. I told you stories before. You know, I, I've been uh, at school teaching. I've been, uh, at, you know, when I was teaching high school, I've been at other places. I've been driving on the road. One time God reached in the car and put his arms around me, and I had a pullover on the side of the road at 2 o'clock in the morning, driving home from San Antonio after teaching a long class, and just said, God, I can't even drive right now. God's so good. His love's so good, and it's so overwhelming. You know, and so you've got to get to that place where you love him that much and you want him that much. It's not just about coming here and hearing the word. Again, it's not just about doing the word. It's about getting to know him, you yourself personally, through the word, through the teaching, through the discipleship, through your training, through your actions. But ultimately, it's about coming to him on his terms. I'm just laying the terms out for you. Finally, be strong in the king and in the strength of his might. Be strong in him. It's not your power. See, this is the problem with isms, right? This is the problem with isms. It doesn't matter what ism you're talking, Taoism, shamanism, uh, you know, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism. All the problem with isms is it's all by your strength and by your ability and by your desire uh, to obtain the power. When you're in Christ, you realize, I, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to try. I don't have to, 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 to uh, 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 try to become self-empowered because I have access to the full source. I have access to the Son. I have access to the Son of the living God. I have access to the King. And it's by His power and by His might. Nothing can overcome Him. He has uh, the head rule over all authority, and He has all the power. And if I have access to Him, I have everything that I'll ever need. I don't need demons. I don't need seances. I don't need sweat lodges. I don't need uh, to meditate inside of a temple for 30 days straight with one bowl of rice. I don't need to do that. All I need to do is get on my knees and pray and come to know Him and do what He says. So finally, be strong in the king and in the strength of his might, not your power. Put on the full armor of God. How many of you do that daily? How many of you do? We forget that sometimes, don't we? You forget that. I've taught, I've taught in discipleship training, I've taught what each piece of armor does and how to put it on. So that you'll be able to stand firm. You put it on so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. The devil's always scheming, plotting. Manipulating, deceiving, lying. Like we talked about before. You know, in Islam, the, he, in Islam they, they reference Allah as the, uh, the great deceiver. The great deceiver. Always deceiving, always plotting lies. 
The Bible says the father of lies is Satan, the devil. So the devil's always scheming against you. How he might what? Come three purposes. Steal, kill, and destroy. He always wants to accomplish those wills. So put on the armor of God to prevent him from doing those things. For our struggle, here it is, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this uh, 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 darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness and heavenly places. So, again, we're saying here that the, uh, we're not wrestling against flesh and bone, right? It's not, you know, when, when I have a problem with somebody, it's not necessarily the, the problem isn't always with the individual. It's not always with the man. Sometimes it's the spirit inside the man if they're not of God. When you're resisting and you're fighting uh, the enemy, you're fighting against spiritual forces of wickedness inside people, inside others, inside so stand firm and put on that armor. Verse 13 says, Therefore take up the full armor so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm. So put on the full armor of God because when that day comes and the enemy is attacking you and he's putting thoughts in your mind, you need that helmet of salvation to protect the thoughts of that mind. You need to take every thought captive in the name of Christ. You need to be able to understand how to use that armor. You need to understand how to wield your weapon, how to draw it out. When we're talking about cross drawing today and how to draw out your cross. How to wield your weapon, how to draw out your cross. So here's the answer. No matter how the devil comes against you, if you have the armor of God upon you, no matter how your day's going, no matter how uh, relationships are, no matter how your health, no matter all these things that can come against us, no matter how they are, there's always one response and there's always one answer. I put my armor of God on and I draw out my cross. Amen? I draw out my cross and my cross, now we're not talking about a literal crucifix. Right? It's not a literal crucifix. There's no, there's no power in two sticks tied together. There's not. Not, a, not an ounce, not a bit. Just in the vampire movies. <laughs> Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, having you've come all this way, you've climbed all that height, why are you looking down? Stand firm, resist the enemy, and he will flee from you, the Bible says. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish the, all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation, and now here, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. You need to, have to know how to draw out your sword. With a gun, if I'm strong-sided, I draw out from here. With a sword, you cross draw. And you draw out from your support side. I draw out my sword, which is the word of God. I draw out my sword, which is the word of God. So the answer is in every situation, if you're having a hard day at work, somebody's yelling at you, the boss is getting on to you, can't pay your bills, you're sick, you need to pray for somebody, whatever the case is, draw out your sword. Cross draw. The answer is always the word of God. The answer is always the word of God. Speak back to your problem. Stand upon the word of God and, and claim every promise. How many times do you do that? You let things get to you and get to you and get to you and get to you and get to you until they become shoulder. You keep bearing them and they keep pressing down and keep pressing down and pressing down. Pretty soon you're carrying so much weight carrying so much weight and then finally you get frustrated and you get fed up and then you act like a uh, like a ignorant child and you blame everybody and everything and then next thing you know you you, you collapse under the weight of it now one of the thing two things going to happen you're going to collapse under the weight and you're going to fall down and you're going to realize that you fell down and you're going to realize you need to get back up and you're either going to rely upon the strength of god and you're going to go down to your knees and you're going to pray and you're going to let him lift you back up and you're going to deliver your burden over to him and your problem over to him. And you're going to stand firm in the faith. Or, because you sh shouldered all that false burden, you're going to take that false burden upon yourself, you're going to fall down, and you're going to be discouraged. 
discouraged, right? The Bible says, take courage. Now you're discouraged. You've lost your courage. You've lost your will to fight. You're not standing firm. So you lay down and you join the opponent's team. You give up on God and you go to the enemy and he's got you right where he wanted you. He accomplished his will to steal your anointing, to steal your life, to kill your dreams, to destroy your future. You let him do it. Why? Because you shouldered the false burden. Instead of holding on to these false burdens, the Bible says, cast your cares upon me. Amen? It says, cast your anxieties upon me even. He had to see even went on to clarify. Because why? I care for you. Because he loves you. Because he already accomplished everything. Don't carry these false burdens. The answer is the word of God. Draw, cross draw. Draw out your cross. Draw out your sword. Use the word of God to fight back against that which is the enemy. As we begin to understand about using the, the word of God, the word of God is not, now, is not only applicable to our personal circumstance and situation. Just because I'm going through something, I'm going to use God to get me through it. Imagine, you can live your whole life that way, by the way, and, and many Christians do. They, they stay babes in Christ. They'll always be babies in Christ. They'll never grow from being a baby in Christ because they never can get past the rudimentary teachings of them being saved, forgiven, and that they're loved. They never can get past those three things, so they just stay there. Tell me I'm forgiven. Tell me I'm loved. Tell me I'm forgiven. Tell me I'm loved every day. Tell me you're on my side. Tell me that, tell me that, uh, um, uh, that, that, that I need. Let me you know, reaffirm the fact that I need you. And let me try to just fight the enemy and get through this life and have you on my side. That's so basic. It's so basic. You, you, and, and you're missing the whole point. God doesn't want to. God, he wants you to be saved. He wants you to be born again so that you can live a new life. So you can live life, the Bible says, abundantly. Part of living life abundantly is stop looking, being a baby and trying to facilitate your own needs and being able to facilitate the needs of others, being able to help others, being able to reach out to others, not just out of self-help and with 10 self-help uh, ideas for them, but to be able to reach them with the cross, being able to reach them with the message of the cross, not only the message of the cross, but with the power and the authority of the cross because you know the one who was on the cross and he dwells inside you. God has given us a command. Our command from the king is this. Number one, to bear witness. You have a command from God to bear witness. Part of bearing witness is your testimony. I, 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 in my life, I have witnessed the fact that I am a sinner. I, I, I'll testify that I'm a sinner. I testify that I, uh, that I need God. I testify that God has come into my heart and into my mind. I'm born again. I am changed. Everything that I used to be like, I'm no longer like because I've been made new. I'm a new creature in Christ. And I can testify to that. I bear witness that God is alive. He is active. And he desired me and he desires you to make your life better. So we're called to go and bear witness and testify about Christ and what he's done for us. To give our testimony testimony and the testimony of Christ and him crucified. The second thing we're called to do is to spread the good news, not just tell people about what he's done for us, but what he can do for them. You don't have to live life this way. I've said it before when people are the hardest people in my mind to get to are the young. You know, people, you know, the people that are in their in the 20s, you know, uh, you know 16 to 20, 9 or something. You know, somewhere in that age, age bracket, they're hard to get to. Why? But not only because they think they know it all, not only because of that, but because a lot of times people have been sheltered or they've come to their own ideas and their own conclusions about things and they create their own God and they create their own, uh, they're, they're seeking and searching, but they're looking in all the wrong places. I know I was one of them. And not, on, not only that, but a lot of times you can't, you, you, you can't tell them anything. They're not, they're not able to receive, and they don't want to know. All they want to know is what they know. But there's one who knows more than what I know and what they know, and it's God. So our job is to introduce them to God. But one of the primary th problems, and, and I'll stop with this, is, is this. One of the primary problems is, is that a lot of times younger people haven't been through much. So some, now, don't get me wrong. There are some people that, that are, I mean, I know kids that are 14 years old that have been through hell. You know, and they've been through more than most adults have that are 60, you know? 
in their short little life spans. I mean, it's terrible. But, but a lot of times people that have the strongest uh, opinions and uh, lean towards liberalism and lean towards um, atheism and agnosticism and so forth are people who don't need faith. They don't need faith because they don't have to live a lifestyle of faith because they're not going through anything that requires faith. That, does that make sense at all? They're not having to fight to live. They're not suffering. They're not, they haven't seen death. They haven't seen atrocities and horrors. They haven't seen evil. I told y'all another side note. I told y'all a long time ago. Some of you know this, some of you don't. I remember, um, you know, I, I've seen all facets of evil from all over the world, right? I mean, it, it, whether it's witches covens attacking me or warlocks or whether it's voodoo's people trying to place curses on me and leave blood and stuff. I mean, whether, wh- whatever it is, I mean, okay, fine. Demons attacking, ah, great. Principalities, ah, okay, great. Not a problem. The, 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 the greatest evil, even to this day, I've ever felt in my life wasn't from a warlock, a witch, or a black, black uh, magic priestess or anything like that. The greatest evil I ever felt was when I sat next to a man and he gave me, which is almost impossible to do for me, he gave me just chills. You know, just, oh, man, I wasn't even saved. And I just felt dirty and I felt, I, I, I felt like, I almost felt like he was sucking me in, you know what I mean? Like the darkness was drawing me in. It's just like you wanted to pull away and get away before you fell in, before he ate you. <laughs> I mean, really, it was terrible. And I asked, I asked the guy that, that was in charge of us in this facility. <laughs> I asked him, I asked the guy, I said, God, who, who is this guy? And he says, you don't know? I said, no, man. <laughs> I'm locked up. I don't know what's going on. He said, oh, you don't know who this guy is? I said, no, I don't. He said, this is the guy that's on the news. What are you talking about? This is the guy that murdered that three-year-old little girl and raped her, and they just found her body, who abducted that six-year-old child and molested him and, and threw him out the car on the highway, and he got ran over and killed. He's, he was guilty of ki- killing, killing and raping and murdering this, and like three children. Just in the la- like, like two, two or three weeks a period of time. And they, they, they linked him to more others, I believe, later. And he had, and uh, sitting next to him, he was solemn and just sat there. He wasn't really looking at anybody or doing anything. He had the uh, pentagram on him and he had, you know, some other um, occultic symbols. That makes sense. That's evil incarnate. I mean, that's just evil incarnate. A lot of times people haven't experienced something like that. When you experience evil to that magnitude, see, evil, and I don't know why I'm going here, but somebody must need to hear it because evil will tempt you and lure you just not long enough where you believe it's light, but and you believe it's good and you believe it's okay, but it's the false light and you really don't recognize it because you don't have any ill intent or ill purposes uh, behind it. You're not trying to do something wrong. You're trying to help and do something right. But evil will draw you and draw you and draw you and draw you till you keep getting closer and closer and you feel like better about yourself because you're becoming more and more empowered and you're getting more and more spiritual strength and spiritual uh, acuity but sooner or later it, 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 you get close enough you get empowered enough and the lights kind of get flipped on and you recognize that what you've been chasing after and what you've been calling upon and what the power is that's been drawing and pulling, pulling you and empowering you is not of God or nor any facet of God but it's actually Satan deceiving you and luring you to the darkness but it's a false light the same false light, again, found in all the isms. Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Think about that, what that means. We have to put on the full armor of God. We have to bear witness. We have to go and spread the good news. We have to be discipled and trained and know the truth. Number three, we have to go out and preach Christ and the kingdom of God. We have to preach Christ and Him crucified. We know there's two different messages that have to be preached, right? We've talked about that before. We preach Christ and Him crucified. That's message number one. If pe- most Christians get stuck there and never go on to message number two, which is the message that Christ preached, the kingdom of God. So they need to know both components. You can't leave them with half the story. 
You can't leave with volume one when there's a volume two. So you have to know it yourself. And then number four, we have the Great Commission. The Great Commission of God, right? I'm going to say it right. Raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons. Preach the good news, make disciples of all nations. That's the great commission that God has given to each and every man. So our word is, uh, our, our desire here again is to bear witness, spread the good news, preach Christ in the kingdom. Now we have a co-mission. Does that make sense? A mission that comes alongside that. While we're doing these three, three we add this other facet onto it. We add this other dynamic onto it where we're doing those things along the way. It's our co-mission. As we're doing that, when the flesh rises up within us or people's flesh rise up against us, our response and our answer is what? The cross, the word of God, the sword of the spirit. When it rises up inside your head and you can't take it and it's telling you to do things that you know aren't right, but you don't, you're willing to succumb to them, you want to lay down to them, you, you want to keep on doing it because you're comfortable, at least you know about them. No. Choose the right way that you may live because the other way is death. Choose the light, the true light of the living God. Choose the sun. The Bible says take every thought captive in the name of Christ. That doesn't mean to just... To ignore that it's there, that means to actually take it captive. And I, I, and I think that's another time for another teaching, but you know, under, you need to understand how to take thoughts captive. Sometimes it can be very hard to do when the enemy is really attacking. But that's why you need to buy the full armor of God on. And you need to understand how to utilize and wear the helmet. What's our response to the flesh? The cross. What's our response to the wickedness, to evil, to the enemy when the enemy is attacking us? The word of God. We draw our cross. What is the word of God? How do we, you know, what are you talking about exactly? I, you know, I know you said it's not pulling out the crucifix, but you, well, you say we stand on the word of God, we claim the promises of God, but how do we use that word? Here's what you need to know. Okay, I'm going to try to make it clear. There's two components to the word of God. The Logos and the Rhema. The Logos and the Rhema. The Logos is the written word of God. That which is written. You need to know the scriptures and you need to know the one who wrote them. We've already established that. But in any given situation, you need to be, know God enough to where you're able to hear his voice. The Bible says, uh, my, my sheep hear my voice and another's, they won't follow because they know mine. So you need to be able to hear his voice. And if you can hear his voice... His voice will always line up with the written word. It will never contradict it. And as you're, that's what discipleship training is about, by the way. You know this. People say, well, I don't really got time to go. I, I go to services. That's good enough. You're not being discipled. You're not being trained. Now, I know we haven't done it lately. But when we do it, reinstitute it, you need to be, on, to be there so that you can be trained to hear the voice of God, trained to do the will of God, trained to go out and fight for God. What soldier hasn't undergone training? You're a soldier in the army of the Lord. Amen? So the rhema word of God is simply this. The rhema is the revealed word of God. As he's speaking it, it's revealed unto you. It's alive. It's the, the revealed word of God as he's speaking it out to you. So if you're in a situation, the enemy's attacking, and you start claiming, you start speaking scriptures, amen, great, hallelujah, keep on going. But what's better than that? God giving you a fresh word. He said, yeah, those are good scriptures. I said those things. That's my stuff. I wrote it. I'm going to give you some new stuff to say. I'm going to tell you to say this exactly. Speak this. Pray this over that person. Intercede and say this prayer. Don't just say what comes to your mind because the mind is unfruitful in prayer. If you're trying to pray just with your head, you ain't going to get anywhere. That's how you learn initially. That's okay. But eventually you need to get past praying in your head. You need to get to the place where you learn to pray in the Spirit. God's telling you what to say and you say it. Don't you think that's going to be most effective when you say the words that he says? So what's the response to wickedness, to evil, to the enemy, to the flesh? It's the word of God, the sword of the spirit. You cross-draw it out. 
and you use the word of the living God. Amen? The rhema word. The Bible says like this. It says, uh, it says a fitly spoken word is like rain in due season. Everybody say, I need some rain. Need some rain. Amen? Amen? Who doesn't want, who here does not want a fresh word from God? I just take the old word, God, I'm good. God's word's good, and it answers everything that we need. But sometimes, you know, when you receive a word from God, it, it has a way to speak directly into your spirit, directly into your soul, and to bring you comfort, and to bring you release, and to give you uh, everything that you need, because God is speaking that word to you. Now, whether you're speaking it to you through someone else is irrelevant. The fact is, we all need revealed rhema words of God every once in a while because fresh words from God are good. He says, behold, I do a new thing. Amen? When you're going out and you're drawing your sword, now remember, if we're talking about cross draw, so we're talking about using that weapon, right? So you're going out into the world and now you're beginning to understand you need to put on the armor of God, stand firm, climb the hill, look down, survey the land and see where your enemies are, but don't be fearful, don't fret. You need to look up and recognize that God is your strength and when you recognize that he's your strength, he's got your back and you're not afraid and you have no fear, no fear because you realize he's your strength. He's on your side because you're in his presence, because you're in his will. And you're walking in righteousness, and he's that lamp unto your feet. You've got to go out, and you've got to do these things. You've got to uh, take a stand, and you've got to uh, preach the word, preach the good news, preach the kingdom of God, preach Christ and him crucified. You've got to testify in your workplace, testify at the gas station, testify. I mean, you've got to do these things. This is what you're here for. Amen? Uh, this is what you're here for. You're not on this worth, just to, uh, on, uh, that's world worth. You're not on this world just to get by and make a buck so you can squeak by from one day to the next. You're, uh, you're here in the world to fulfill the will of God. You're his ambassador. He don't have that many, by the way. It's, it's true. He doesn't have that many. First, Matthew chapter 10, verse 26 through 28. says, Therefore do not fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known what i tell you in the darkness speak in the light and what you hear whispered in your ear uh huh rama proclaim upon the housetops do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul but rather fear him being god who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell so don't fear any man, any institution, or anything. Only fear God. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. See, a religious person will read this, and a religious person will say, well, yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. Don't fear anybody. Okay, just fear God because God's in charge. He's most powerful. And they live their life saying, I don't have to fear anything. I'm good. What is this in response to? This is in response to you going out preaching the word. This is in response to you testifying. This is in response to you sharing the gospel, sharing the good news. When people come against you for doing it, because the Bible says if you are a follower of Christ, you will be hated for my name's sake. This is in response to that. You're not going to be hated sitting on your couch eating Pringles. You can be hated when you're in the parking lot and you're in, in, in your in gentleness and in kindness and in humility, you're preaching uh, and you're trying to, to help somebody, you're trying to share the good news with somebody, and then they turn around because they're full of Satan and, and, and they lash out at you with verbal assaults and with hatred and with disgust uh, because you're not politically correct, because uh, you, you've taken a stand uh, on that which is right and that which is wrong because you say well, God's right and everything that, that, that's against God is wrong. You take that stand and you're now you're intolerant. Yes, I'm intolerant. I don't tolerate sin because God doesn't tolerate sin because he hates sin. And he says, I should hate sin because sin keeps me from my father and it keeps you from eternal life. They'll hate you because of that, because you take a stand. This is a response to that. Now, remember what it says right here. And what you hear whispered in your ear. A religious person doesn't hear anything whispered in their ear except from the enemy. I want to share with you a scripture that I think will encourage you. 
Because when we leave here today, we're called to go out. Each and every single day, we're called to go out. And we're called to be bold witnesses of our Savior. We're called to be disciples that follow him. We're called to be able to hear his voice and to, to follow him and let him lead us in every facet of our life without doubt, without fear, without looking back and looking down. But in order to do that, we have to recognize whom it is we're following. We started the message off today by talking about that. We're, we're following after the king of kings, the God of gods, the creator of all, the one who has all rule and all power and all authority and who has overcome all things and has given us everything that we need to be successful, to fight the good fight of faith, and we always are guaranteed the victory. Even in our death, we win. Even if a bus hits me on the way out the door, I win. If a sniper catches me, I win. I'm going somewhere. I know where I'm going. I don't have to go murder 50 people to get to heaven. All I have to do is get down on my knees, stand back up and start walking after him and tell everybody along the way about him. Amen? We follow and we worship and we serve a power, the most powerful force in, that ever existed because he created all things that exist. Listen to what Zephaniah chapter 3 says. We're going to break this down. Verse 1. Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the tyrannical city. She heeded no voice. She accepted no instruction. She did not trust in Yahweh. She did not draw near to her God. Now, if you take the city out of it and just replace it with the person, how many people does this define? The majority. Because the Bible says the whole world has been deceived. The whole world has been deceived by the deceiver. Woe to you or to that person who doesn't listen to God, who's rebellious to God. Because of your rebelliousness, you are defiled. You are stained. You heeded no voice. You accepted no instruction. You did not trust in Yahweh and did not draw near to God. God says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. Seek me. I'm already reaching out for you. Verse 3. Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are wolves at evening. They leave nothing for the morning. Her prophets are reckless and treacherous men. Her priests have profaned the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. Without getting into all of that, it's just saying they're greedy, they're manipulative, they're deceitful, they're deceivers, they're liars. They've profaned this sanctuary of God, being false teachers, false prophets, false apostles, apostles and, and uh, unbelievers and antichrist spirits. They have done violence to the law. They have done violence to the Ten Commandments of God. They have assaulted God's word so that others won't follow his word and believe his word. So they believe there's only nine commandments and not 11. Verse 5. Yahweh is righteous within her. He will do no injustice. Every morning he brings his justice to light. He does not fail. But the unjust knows no shame. And I quote, I have cut off nations. Their corner towers are in ruins. I have made their streets desolate with no one passing by. Their cities are laid waste without a man, without an inhabitant. I said, surely you will revere me. Accept instruction so her dwelling will not be cut off. According to all that I have appointed concerning her, but they were eager to corrupt all their actions, all their deeds. What is this a picture of? This is a picture of Christ returning. He's saying, listen, I, it's my desire that none shall perish. It's my desire that you share and spread the good news with everybody so that they might have a hope, they might have a future, so they might be saved. But it's up to you to reach them. But if they don't, if you reach them and they don't receive my instruction, they don't receive you as an ambassador. They don't receive you as the word of God. They don't receive my word as the holy word of God. They don't even seek to look it out and search the thing out, but they just accept what people tell them, but they don't accept instruction from God. Isn't that funny how people are always you know, willing to believe any ancient text that's written from any unknown source, but they never want to believe the Bible? 
You know, I, you, you could throw a, um, you know, you, you could come up and you could, you could find, some, you know, you could get some old parchment paper and pour some uh, Lipton tea on it and put it in the oven for a little while and write something in, anything you want to write on it and say Yoda made it, you know. We, Yoda lived and he was real and, and this is Yoda's text. And you know what? You'd have a million followers. You'd have a million believers that would follow after Yodaism. You would, and they wouldn't bat an eye, and nobody else, no other, un other unbelievers would think any less of them. Because anything's okay as long as it's not the word of God. Why is that? Because the devil is a liar. And he says, listen, I don't care what religion you serve. I don't care who you go after. I don't care what you create. I don't care what you make up. Because ultimately, you're, only serving, you're all serving me. You just don't know it. But whatever you do, don't. Don't do that. You'll be hated for my name's sake. Verse 8. Therefore, wait for me, declares the king, for the day when I rise up as a witness. Indeed, my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger, for all the earth will be devour, devoured by the fire of my zeal. He's coming back, the great and terrible day of the Lord, the day when he returns unto the earth, when the trumpet sounds and we rise up and then we come back down, then they will know that he is God. And the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he alone is God, that he is the king. Amen. They will know he's the king when he returns. And he says, I'm going to gather all the nations. Remember, during the millennial reign of Christ, all the nations will have to come and pay homage. Those who don't come and pay homage to the King of kings, to the God of the creator of the universe, if they don't come and pay homage to them, so there will be no reign on their land. It's not that he's withholding it from them. They're withholding themselves from him. It's their decision. It's always your decision. All the earth, we know the Bible says that he would not destroy the world with water again like he did in the days of Noah. But the next destruction comes with fire, intense burning, intense heat. It says the tongue will cleave to the roof of the mouth and the flesh will fall from the skin before the bones have a chance to hit the ground. An intense fire will come and will burn the whole world up as God judges the world. As he gathers us together, we will be selected and we will be protected in the shadow of his wings. Verse 9. For then, after that occurs, I will give to the people's purified lips, purified lips, that all of them may call on the name of the king to serve him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my dispersed ones, will bring my offerings. And that day you will feel no shame because all of your deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst you proud, exulting ones, and you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. So God said, I'm getting rid of all the evil. I'm getting rid of all the ones who are prideful. And there are only going to be those who are willing to serve me, who are willing to humble themselves before me, who are willing to follow after me, who are willing because of their actions in which I've judged them by to serve and to come after me and do my will. There will only be those who are left, and you will no longer feel shame of being the minority. And no one will ever be found upon the holy mountain of God being haughty again, full of pride. See, remember, Satan, pride's what entered into Satan. And it caused every problem that we have today. But verse 12, he says, I will leave among you a humble and a lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of Yahweh. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths, for they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. Isn't that awesome? When God's saying that he's going to protect us, we're going to take refuge in him. No longer we have to worry about people telling lies because there will be no evil. There will be no more deceit. There will be no, uh, there will be no hunger. He will feed us and we will lie down in pleasant places. And we will not tremble because we know God and we know that our God is our protection. He's our fortress. He's our strength. And he is our shield. He is our sword. He is whom we draw out. When we draw out Christ, when we draw out the sword, we're drawing out the word of God. And he is the living God. 
So when you're drawing out that sword that way, what you're saying is, I'm pulling, I, and I don't say this in a disrespectful way, but what I'm, I'm just trying to get you the vision of it. When you're pulling out the sword of the Spirit, you're pulling out Christ. You're pulling out the Spirit of the living God to contend with the enemy. You're not alone. You're not alone. You can fight back. You can stand. And if you pull Christ out, who can stand against him? No one. No one. Listen to this as we come to an end. Verse 14 says, Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Yahweh has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, Yahweh, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. And that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. Yahweh, your God, is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. That's our king, amen? amen. A victorious warrior who will protect us like his children and exult over us with shouts of joy saying that you have nothing to fear. Everything has been conquered. All evil is done away with. There's no more judgments pending against you. You are cleared. You're going to live with me and be with me, and I will protect you for all eternity. I am the king. I am God. Amen? Amen. Then he says in verse 18 as we close, he says, I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feast. They came from you, O Zion. The reproach of exile is a burden on them. Behold, I am going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in, even at the time when I gather you together. Indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says Yahweh. When he creates a new heaven and a new earth, the followers of Christ, according to what you have done, will be established upon the new earth in the new kingdom. And according to what you have done will be according to what purpose and what plan you fulfill and what role you play there. The last verse for today. As you think about drawing out Christ, as you think about standing firm, as you think about that my reaction to every situation, to every complication, to every word spoken against me, to every attack upon me, to every just basic life situation that's just part of living life, according to every circumstance that can rise up, according to every wave that seeks to drown out, according to every word that's spoken against, everything that is happening to me and happening to those around me, it's not about just fighting for me, but it's about fighting for others. Did you notice in the scripture it said that we will be shoulder to shoulder? Military formation. We will be shoulder to shoulder fighting on behalf of the king going forward. Do you know that it is you, the, believe, the followers of God, who will judge Satan and the fallen angels? That it is you, the Bible says, we will trample the enemy under our feet. We will crush Satan under our feet, the scripture says. You're going to do that. And God's going to lead the way, shouting with joy and praise and exulting over you. And you know what? I've got to be honest with you. If it was just me and about 15 others stomping Satan under my feet, I'd be like, hey, man, this dude's going to get up any second. I know it. <laughs> right? But when God's above you and around you and surrounding you and he's shouting with joy and triumphing with victory, then I ain't worried about nothing. <laughs> Amen? And Acts 26 says this, But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. So to us that's rescuing us, and he sent us into the world, to open the eyes of the world so that they may turn, listen, to open the eyes of the world so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me, in Christ. 
that's our job. Get up, stand up, fight. Shoulder to shoulder. It's not just stop whining and being a baby. I, I've got to tell you, oh, Lord, it just troubles my spirit when I see people that are just babified. They just got it. You know, sometimes we fall down. Sometimes we're weak. And, but we have brothers and sisters who encourage us. But if you live in diapers your whole life, you got a problem. Amen? you got to stand up and fight and say, you know what? Yeah, I'm going through something, but it's not about me. Oh, man, I don't know what to do right now. Pull out your sword. Give me a word, God. Let me give you a fresh word. God said, no, I ain't telling you nothing. You need to go listen to somebody else. You need to go get, get under authority. You need to be submissive. You need to learn to be a servant. You need to learn to bow down. You need to learn to humble yourself. You've been prideful too long. That's what got you in this position to begin with. He sends us out to fight the good fight of faith. Amen? He sends us out as warriors to stand not as babies, but as warriors, not as weenies, but to stand shoulder to shoulder. Get our sword. Now, if I got, if Brother Minister Zach stands up here and he's got his sword out, I got my sword out, I got my shield up, I'm ready to go to war. Why? Because where two or three are gathered, I'm present and in their midst. Two can chase, one can chase a thousand, two, ten thousand, three, a hundred thousand, four million. Can put the enemy at flight. Because we're blood washed, born again believers, empowered by the word of God, not relying on our strength and might, not relying upon what I can conjure, not relying on what I can tap into, but relying upon whom I know. My Savior, my King, my Master, my victorious warrior, Christ, the one who raised himself from the dead, overcame the grave, and gave us victory everlasting. Amen? Amen. I'll fight that fight because I'm guaranteed the victory. I'm a winner, and so are you. You're a warrior. You're an ambassador. You're a called out one. You're a church. church. You're a saint, a holy priesthood, a peculiar people. You're God's child, an inheritor of the kingdom. Why don't you act like it? Respond like it. Draw out your sword. As you stand, I want you to listen to this song and ask praise God for who he is, for what he is, and what he's going to do through you and in you. Amen? Let's praise God and recognize that he alone is God and let us draw out our swords on today. <laughs> 